Um, so, welcome everybody. It is wonderful to see you this evening. Um, I am actually broadcasting, my name is Stephanie Plunkett, I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator here at the museum, and I'm broadcasting from beautiful Linwood House. This is the museum's 1859 Berkshire Cottage, and uh, it was the original building on the museum's property. So here we are in the uh, the parlor, which is something that we now use for meetings, fortunately, and uh, we're very happy to welcome you. We want to thank you, actually, for adjusting your schedule uh, this evening to join us after yesterday's storm, um, which took all of our power out, both uh, here and south in Connecticut and over in New York State, and we hope you're all doing well uh, tonight, too. Uh, we are excited for this look inside the lives and careers of Liza Donnelly and Michael Maslin, two noted New Yorker cartoonists who also happen to be married. Their love of cartooning and the art of James Thurber brought them together in the 1980s, and many years later, it is perhaps no surprise that their relationships and family life, that relationships and family life are central themes in their work. In addition to creating cartoons for The New Yorker and other publications since the late 1970s, the couple has co-edited several cartoon collections, including Cartoon Marriage, Adventures in Love and Matrimony by The New Yorker's Cartooning Couple, Husbands and Wives, and Call Me When You Reach Nirvana. They have also worked on important independent projects focusing on the history of their field. Now, during this program, we are going to welcome your questions and comments, and um, we have a couple of stopping points along the way. So if you are either on the webinar or on YouTube, you can post those questions in, in the chats. And if you're on the webinar, uh, you will actually be able to pose your questions to Liza and Michael yourselves if you would like, and we can queue you up to do that. I'd like to just thank my colleagues who are working behind the scenes, Rich Bradway, Mary Burley, Alyssa Stubel, and they are making that uh, possible, which is terrific. And welcome also to all of you. We are thrilled to have you. And it's just my pleasure now to just give you a little background on Liza and Michael, and then we are going to turn the program over to them. Raised in Washington, DC, Liza Donnelly began drawing cartoons at an early age. Her cartoons and live digital drawings have been featured in The New Yorker, where she has been a staff artist since 1979, on CBS News, NBC, and CNN, and in Forbes, Fusion, Medium, Narrative, Politico, The Daily Beast, Open Salon, The Huffington Post, and Women's E! News, among others. Liza has given a TED Talk and has spoken internationally and at the United Nations on behalf of Cartooning for Peace, an organization that defends fundamental freedoms and democracy. Her column and drawings on politics and global women's rights appear regularly in the online publication Medium. A self-described described feminist, Liza is the author of Funny Ladies, the New Yorker's Greatest Women Cartoonists and Their Cartoons, which chronicles the history of women and cartoons, Sex and Sensibility, which offers female perspectives on love, Women on Men, which was a finalist for the Thurber Prize for American Humor, and other humor books for adults. Dinosaur Day, Dinosaur Beach, and Dinosaur Valentine are among her many children's picture books, and some of those are also on view in her exhibition. Raised in Bloomfield, New Jersey, Michael Maslin studied art at the University of Connecticut and had his first drawing published in The New Yorker's April 17, 1978 issue. His hilarious cartoons have appeared in the magazine since then, as well as many other noted publications, including Harper's Magazine, The New York Times, Mother Jones Time, The Saturday Evening Post, Harvard Business Review, and many others. In 2009, he began the blog Ink Spill, which is a website devoted to New Yorker cartoonist news and which has also been cited in The New York Times. Michael has worked on many cartoon collections, and he is a historian of his field. He spent 15 years researching and writing Peter Arno, The Mad, Mad World of the New Yorker's Greatest Cartoonist, 
which is a biography of the legendary artist published in 2016. We are so happy to welcome Liza and Michael. And I'm actually going to just post a PowerPoint, which will just get them started uh, talking a little bit about their lives and experiences as artists. Yeah, there we are. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a, a, a very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's pretty, it's close to where we're sitting right now. We're over here. I mean, you can't see it. But um, that's our living room. Our house is uh, very old, 18, 18 years or so. And uh, that's our dog, Bernie, who's no longer with us. Um, we got married in 1988. <laughs> in, in the yard, in, not in this house, but we had a party in this yard. So we're in the Hudson Valley. It's a beautiful part of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful site. Um, we yeah, had the wonderful awesome. opportunity to visit with you as we were organizing the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, you couldn't ask for a more beautiful place to live. For but. sure. We always like old houses, so we, we lucked out and found this. And um, across the street, it's a very small little hamlet. Jump in anytime. You're doing great. Uh, it's a small hamlet outside of the town of Rhinebeck. And um, didn't have much property when we bought it, but this, ha this structure was across the street. And this used to be the post office and general store downstairs for this little hamlet called Mile and Mill. And uh, upstairs is where my studio is now. And it's, uh, it was a, uh, a boxing, place for boxing and dancing, apparently. We were told by an old man who's a little wood. And that's my studio, the inside of my studio. Yeah, it's a beautiful big space and um, lots of great light. Yeah. It's um, really wonderful to see, too, that you have uh, some of your own work in the studio that does not pertain to cartoons. And I think you're seeing a little bit of it here. Yeah, that's one of my paintings. <laughs> I, I, I have had uh, periods of time where I do abstract paintings, and that's okay. one of them. They're really favorite. wonderful, and I think there's another here as well. Uh, actually, the, the, the pair is by our daughter, and um, this is also, these are also the two smaller pieces are both by our daughters, and there's another abstract mm -hmm. above, above those. Um, but that's my main desk where I, where I do things. What's that little time? What's that? Oh, the little black uh, black frame is a, a, a picture, is a, a photograph of, of our two daughters. Oh. And actually what you're seeing here is my colleague Rich on the left-hand side. He's behind the scenes today, but um, he did a beautiful video focusing on Liza's career, yeah. and that can be found online or in the exhibition if you're able to make it. And this is Michael's space. Yeah, that's where I work now. I, I actually worked most of the, our years here. We were 30 some years. Mm -hmm. there. And most of those years I worked in a, uh, what used to be the laundry room. And uh, it became so crowded in the last few years, I had to leave. So <laughs> I, I left that room just pretty much, I didn't close the door when I left the door open, but I walked out of that room and I set up shop in our living room, just feet away from where we're sitting, and happened to be a table there. So I sat at that table, but really I have some books around me. But in front of me now is just space. And the other thing, the other room, if we had a picture of it, you would see the difference. The other room is, you can't really move in there. I, I ran out of space even to work. So this is really a wonderful new, uh, I guess, what, a year or so, two years or maybe? Yeah, something, something like that. Two years maybe. But I really love being here now and having all this elbow room. And you always wanted to be You always wanted to be in the house. I wanted to be in the <laughs> outbuilding when we got married and moved here. Um, but you always wanted to be where the action was. I wanted to be removed. <laughs> we split, when we were younger and raising kids, we had two daughters, we split our time equally. So he would watch the kids for four hours and that, while I worked. Swap, so. Oh, that's a great system. Yeah, worked out. So this is a little bit of the story, I think, this cartoon of how you guys
guys actually met. Would you want to say a little bit about it and tell everybody what's happening here? Yeah, this is one of the narratives from the book Cartoon Marriage. Did you say that? Um, we did uh, Cartoon Marriage is a book we did and has, and we'll talk about that later. Maybe, but sort of about how we met. Um, well, it seems like it all began on a cartoon night. Yeah, it was a cartoon show exhibit of, of work by lots of different cartoonists put on. The, the show was was uh, conceived and, and curated by Roxy Monroe, who at the time was a cover artist and a friend of mine. And she's now a, a really well-known children's book author and, and illustrator. So anyway, she put the show on and it was at Parsons School of Design. And, um, and it traveled to Washington as well. So that's where we met. October 4th, 1984. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see, there was a photograph taken and so we both, we drew this together. Michael drew the, the top panel and I drew the lower left panel and then Michael drew the lower right panel. So that's how these narratives in the book went. We really sh shared everything. Um, I wonder if you would want to just read your two different perspectives on the evening. It's really kind of funny. Uh, okay, the question yeah. is longer than this, but this, this is an abbreviated. Okay. Liza's memory, a group photo was taken of the cartoonist without Michael, but I didn't know that. I didn't know. I didn't know him, so I didn't know he wasn't in the photo. And uh, my memory, I didn't know anybody. The only cartoon I remember looking at was Liza's, which is true. And that cartoon is at the Norman Rockwell Museum. I was happy to see it. Mm -hmm. The, uh, I don't pet dogs. We're going to see it in a minute. Yeah, I think we're going to see it. We'll and, see it in a minute, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that truly is the only cartoon I remember from that night. And the reason I noticed it was because uh, it's very odd to see, for me, somebody new, and I, did, I didn't recognize her name, and I didn't know she was a she, I just knew she was a new cartoonist, and uh, that was fascinating to me. You still like that. You still love when you spot a new cartoonist in the magazine. Like, who is that? I want to know who that person is. Who's that? Um, yeah, the cartoon community is a nice community. I mean, it's uh, it's small, small-ish New Yorker cartoonists. So. Parties are always fun because you tend to know everybody. So this is uh, first, how can I put it, full, full cartoon. I, I sold an idea to the New Yorker in uh, 1977. And uh, shocking to me at the time, I'd been trying for a long time, seven years, which I heard Ed Corrin say the other night, he and I talked about this afterwards. We both had to go through seven years of rejection I had you there. And um, so it took seven years, but when I sold something, I actually sold an idea. And at the time I had no clue that they just would buy the idea for a cartoon. And so it was kind of an odd situation because I could tell friends, well, I sold something to the New Yorker, but when you see it, it's not my drawing. It's, it's what you get which means drawing. Yeah, so they bought the idea. Yeah. Then. And then a few months later, they bought, the whole thing, drawing and, and, and uh, caption. And that's what this is. And it ran, I think it was bought right after uh, the beginning of the new year, 78. It ran in April, as you said, 78. So the very first one, very, you know, the first drawing is always the one you can remember a lot. That was, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't know you, I didn't know you then. Was your first one? Yeah, yeah it is, but I wanted to say that that was typical that was not untypical to for them to buy ideas from beginning cartoonists. Um, it might, you know, you send in your weekly bunch of drawings and they'll buy one, but they won't buy the drawing, they'll buy the idea to give to one of the more established guys, and they were all guys at the time. Okay. Um, and yours idea was given to Whitney Darrow Jr. But like Charles Adams, he was, one of, was given one of your ideas later on, and yes. other, other, I mean, it's not that they didn't do their own ideas, they did, but they also, they needed some assistance yeah, I guess so. as time went by. <laughs> and this is my. So now, was this the cartoon you were referring to, Michael? That's it. Therapy. So um, this is sequential drawing, uh, and uh, there's a couple things I can say about this. But uh, it was actually the second cartoon they bought from me. The first one, they didn't run. They bought in 1979, and they didn't run it until after this one. So they, they bought this one second, and then ran this one first. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, uh, this, uh, 
and Stephanie, you know this story, you, you found it amusing, and I thought it was interesting, because they don't always give you direction in cartoons. They, they either buy it or they don't. But sometimes the art, art editor, who was Lee Lorenz at the time, would, would give you a little advice or a little suggestion, a little nice suggestion, what you might do differently in the drawing. So when I sent this as a sketch, it had the dog tied to a post in the ground. And, and Lee said, well, shouldn't, shouldn't the dog be tied to a parking meter or something like that? So I said, oh yeah, you're right. There are no posts in the ground in the city, really. So um, I went out and I sketched some parking meters for a while and then I came back and drew this. So um, yeah, they, the New Yorker likes sequential drawings. This is in the 70s and 80s, this is in the 80s. Uh, Sean, William Sean, I think, liked sequ sequential drawings, and uh, I, they bought a number of these types of, now we call them graphic narratives, but um, they, uh, they bought a bunch of these from, from me. And one of the things that Liza did show us was uh, you had basically a sketchbook full of parking meter drawings. Yes. Which is probably you being out on the street and trying to figure that out. Yeah, no, I, just, I was so nervous. You know, the first drawing that I sold to them, I drew I must have, I showed you that too. I had like a hundred sketches or drawings of that drawing before I got to the one that I thought was good. And uh, who knows why I thought it was good. But um, I said to Lee before I finished the drawing, I called him up on the phone. I said, uh, what style do you want me to draw this in? Because I was so nervous. And he said, well, draw it in your style. And I thought, okay, I have a style? That was exciting to hear that. I'd like to see that. I, I've never seen that page. Is that in the show? No. Oh. <laughs> um, so so this yeah. is actually obviously not either of your drawings. Do you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, I guess I'm going to start with this. Go ahead. Okay. This, is, this drawing changed my life. That's a big thing to say, but it's true. Up to the time I had, before I had seen this drawing, I was, my influences were all over the place. Including Norman Rockwell, as I told you, Stephanie. I was drawing Robert Crumb like things. You know, I was picking a little bit from everybody. And I know Ed Corrin mentioned that the other day about uh, the lion being made up of all the lambs it has eaten. And I, that's so true that uh, I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of lambs in me. And, uh, but the day that my friend Matthew showed me this drawing was in the Thurber, and still is, in the Thurber Carnival. I remember that exact moment, struck by lightning really, and I saw this and everything changed. I stopped drawing the way I, I was drawing and I started heading towards how I draw now. I'm still not finished. But, uh, I think I'm still changing, but this particular drawing changed it all and, and made me uh, become a Thurber fanatic and Beyond that, a New Yorker fanatic because of Thurber. So uh, it all came out of that drawing for me. So this, yeah, uh, James Thurber, for those of you who don't know, was a writer first at the New Yorker, a humor writer. He wrote really funny short stories. Um, Secret Life of Walter Mitty is one that many people know. Um, but then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you know, midway into his time at, at the New Yorker, he started doing cartoons oh, just a few years. A few years from, um, for them. And they were very loose like this. It's just his style. He was not trained as an artist, um, but that's what makes his work, I think, so wonderful. And the way it works so well with the captions so often. Uh, we don't have a lot of caption cartoons here but of his, but uh, I, I, this is something that brought Michael and I together at Thurber, is that we both started drawing because of James Thurber, or I, or I started drawing because of James Thurber, because my mother gave me a book of Thurber cartoons, a Thurber Carnival, it was called Thurber Car Carnival, and uh, I started tracing them, this is when I was seven years old, then, and uh, made her smile, and that was all I needed, was, that was the reinforcement, the re encouragement, so I kept drawing my own cartoons from there, and uh, Thurber is... Uh, very important to me and that and, and and so when when Michael and I met professionally we were like oh we both love Thurber and then our first date was to go see a Thurber an original Thurber at the Armory an auction at the Armory in New York um, and we didn't buy it because we didn't could afford it um, we weren't going to pool our money anyway so we just met but uh, of course, right. the moose. 
So there was okay. a great deal. He's great. He's a wonderful. So there's a great question um, from our audience from, <clears throat> excuse me, the New Yorker cartoonist Michael Shaw, who was actually on a wonderful program with us last week. And yeah. I'm wondering, Mary and Rich, if we could um, invite Michael to pose his question because it does have to do with Thurber and Thurber's influence on you. So I, I think we will be able to do that. Let's see. Okay, but you know what, maybe not, but I'm going to ask the question um, that he actually asked, which is, um, let's see, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the humor of Thurber, um, uh, I need my glasses, I'm sorry, sorry guys, okay. Um, how did the humor of Thurber, uh, which centered mostly on women, and Arno, um, how, would, how would they fare in these enlightened times? Do you think these cartoon times might be so enlightened and mindfully aware of itself that humor is more interested in playing nice rather than actually being funny? That was from Michael Shaw. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, actually, Mary showed me that... Uh, that question yesterday, so I had a heads up on that. Um, hey. Sorry, I <laughs> forgot to show it to you. Um, <laughs> well, I'll say Thurber, I think, Thur I think Michael, I, I maybe disagree, not this Michael, Michael Shaw, you might disagree with me, you might disagree with me too, but I think Thurber would, would, would still be viable now, even though Michael's referring, Shaw's, Michael Shaw's referring to the fact that many of Thurber's women were um, drawn in a stereotypical way, not physically drawn, but he, his cartoons were not very nice to women sometimes, but I think they were in such a way that they, they were real human. They were really human. And I don't think he was, I mean, Thurber may have been a mis misogynist, I don't know, but uh, um, I, I think his cartoons are, would stand, would be acceptable now, I, I, I think. Maybe one or two wouldn't, but uh, um, I just think, uh, well, I mean, I'm growing up looking at his looking at his cartoons as a young woman. I've written about this too. Uh, looking at his cartoons about uh, of women, they were either Thurber's women were either big, you know, stocky, kind of oversized battle axes, you know, that were like bullying men, or they were these wavy kind of floral, sweet women, you know, that were sort of uh, harm, seemingly harmless. So uh, that as a young girl looking at those, I'm like, is this what I'm supposed to be? The one or the other? I like, so, I mean, you could see that his cartoons might be, might be problematic for some people, but I, I don't think so. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. He would be drawing differently now, obviously, right? He, would, he wouldn't be drawing those same. If he was alive now, he wouldn't be. He would, everything would be different. And that goes for Arno. Um, Arno did a lot of uh, drawings back then that were probably deemed acceptable back then, but he wouldn't do those now. I mean, why would he? Because he was totally self-destructive. He wouldn't yeah, so. do that. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting, interesting to note. Artists really are of their time in many ways, and so yeah, that probably would be different if they were working at a different time. Yeah. I wish they were still working, but you know, you yeah. can't hurry. For sure. <laughs> we, have, we have three cats around us, so we don't have one to us up. So, uh, so we invite questions. Um, if anybody uh, wants to jump in with anything, and uh, so otherwise. A lot, of, a lot of things in the chat, chat box. Is that where some people are sending questions? Uh, actually, they're, I'm getting some of them too, so if you, uh, and you may have questions for each other. Um, there was actually one wonderful question which came to us, which had to do with whether or not you being married uh, and doing cartoons about marriage actually work through some issues in your marriage through cartooning. <laughs> uh, you know, well, we talked about this yesterday, how how uh, 
cartoons, how, how our work uh, is affected or not affected by being a married. And the funny thing is, we thought it was funny, was that we couldn't really come up with any examples. We came up with one drawing in 30 some years each of doing this, uh, well, 40 years, I'm sorry, 40 years each of doing this. And uh, that was a drawing I did a long time ago. Uh, one drawing, and that was the only drawing really based on something that happened in our marriage. And uh, I, I think we, it's funny that we just, we could not think of any moment that transferred into a, uh, a yeah, drawing. I don't that, know. Like, oh, that, you, that was funny, Liza. I'm gonna write that down. That, no. That's never happened, or vice versa. I think, I think we're both influenced by marriage in general, and I think our, our marriage may be in that mix, but there's never anything specific that comes out of it. No hidden messages, no no subtlety, uh, no, no uh, yeah, here's working a couple, things out. A couple more questions. Do you have any rules, i.e. no peeking until cartoon is fish finished? Have you ever, ever accidentally drawn the same idea? Um, we, we do have a rule, actually, that we don't look at each other's work in a, in, unless invited to do so. So uh, Always risky. Yeah, we, we do our batches every week, and we don't usually show our cartoons to the other person until um, they're rejected. Not even that. Sold. Really not even that. Yeah. Sometimes. So, I, I have to say, I don't think either of us have seen all of the work we've done. Uh, Probably very, very little of it, I think. Yeah, because we do like six to eight cartoons a week. And but that's a lot of work. I don't run over to Liza and say, hey, look what was rejected this week. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Uh, so most of, I think most of the work we've each done, we haven't seen. Oh, either. somebody wants to see more cartoons. Uh, please show more. Yeah, cartoons. we're going to keep going. Um, one, one question that we did have actually on YouTube was, uh, do you laugh regularly at each other's cartoons? I know you're not seeing all of them, but. Yeah, well, we do. I think we do. I think we do. Uh, I, I love Michael's work. I mean, look at that. <laughs> And Liza, Liza is different from me in that she actually works, I think you have some of the show, sketchbooks. She, she works in a book, which I, I used to do a long time ago, but I stopped doing that and I just work on paper, mostly. But uh, occasionally she'll we'll sit at the kitchen table and she'll open her sketchbook at lunch and she'll open it and she'll be looking at it and, and upside down, I'll see something I'll say, oh, that's funny. Yeah. Upside down is funny. Just, so just doodles. Right side up, yeah. it's even funnier. Uh, so yeah, we do. Uh, I, I want to mention this um, quote that um, uh, our late friend Henry Martin, who died, and I mentioned him up at the Rockwell Museum. Cartoonist. Yeah. yeah, cartoonist. He he said that uh, some cartoonists draw funny, and he mentioned uh, Sampe, who's you know just fabulous cartoonist and cover artist, and um, George Booth, who maybe is the king of drawing funny, I don't know, and just, you know what I mean by that. But Liza is in that group, I think, of oh, people you. that draw funny, and just, um, I don't know. You know, I, I, this, is a, this is a very funny cartoon. Michael, would you read the, um, the caption? Yes. On second thought, you hunt, I'll gather. And uh, I don't usually remember too much where cartoons come from because uh, I, as Liza knows, I don't think too much about them before they, they show up. And the only thing I remember about this one is, and, and I hope Ed Korn is, is see, sees this at some point, because I looked at this the other day and I thought, yeah, I vaguely remember that I was kind of in an Ed Korn beastie mood, you know, like uh, thinking about his those things. Because I usually don't draw that. There's a lot of lines on that mastodon there. Is that a mastodon? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I was really thinking of Ed's work. So you guys uh, should look up Ed Corn. Yeah. His work is amazing. It's great. He, he draws fuzzy, fuzzy creatures. So I think that that came out of that. Just thinking of that's great. That great Ed Corn drawing where he has somebody in a park yelling nine one one nine one one when he's chased <laughs> by the creature. Uh, you know, classic. So somebody else asks, have you ever found yourself working on the same topic in a cartoon based on the fact you're both encountering the same news, locale, movies, etc.? That's Kieran Connolly, who's one of my regular followers on um, 
on Instagram at when I do my Instagram live. He's from Dublin. Thanks, Kieran. Um, the funny thing is about that question is that uh, no, we don't usually. I mean, because I'm more outwardly focused on the news and cultural trends and things like that, whereas Michael's very inner inner focus. So he'll be sitting at his at his desk, just really focused on what's interesting to him, what's funny to him, what's silly to him. So you're very inward, you know, it's all inward. And so um, we don't usually draw about the same thing. So rare, I can't even think of yeah. one time. So this cartoon, uh, some, some Wine with Your Vest, uh, is one of my favorites of mine. And it's uh, from the 90s, I think. And it's um, beginning of a time when I was drawing women speaking up more and making fun of, lovingly making fun of the, the men in their lives. Um, I, I've done a, a several, actually many of these cartoons, and I, I think it was the beginning of a real feminist direction of mine that I never thought, I mean, I've always been a feminist, but I never thought that I needed to, to express it in my cartoons. I just wanted to be a cartoonist. I didn't think I needed to be an activist cartoonist, and that's changed. But um, this is the beginning of like giving women voices in my cartoons that were very um, unique. And um, now when I draw a cartoon, I, I pretty much, I, I, I often like to make the woman the speaker because I can. I mean, back in the 50s in the New Yorker, if you had a woman talking, it sort of meant that she was talking about women's things like cooking or shopping or being a secretary or raising children. But now you can make the woman every man and I try to do that one. That's great, thank you. We have a wonderful question from Judy Burton, and I wonder if Judy, would you like to ask your question directly? Rich is working on it. Okay, another question from somebody, Elwood Smith, I think, commented yeah, on. A wonderful, Elwood Smith. Also yeah. Yeah. Oh, Julie, Judy Burton, I see that. Well, I'll let her. So Elwood, Elwood Smith is a colleague of ours. He's a wonderful humorous illustrator. And he says, perhaps you can talk about your drawing tools. You want to talk about tools? Oh. Thanks, Elwood. Hi, Elwood. Okay. Uh, tools. You have a lot more tools, so you go I first. Know. Well, I always do my New Yorker cartoons, except for one of them uh, I did on my iPad. But I always do my New Yorker cartoons with a Proquill pen and ink, uh, Black Magic Higgins ink. Uh, and, and uh, heavy heavyweight paper. So uh, I also use, for, for other cartoons and illustration and my live drawing, I use um, my iPad. And the one cartoon that I did for the New Yorker on my iPad was a cartoon idea that I came up with when I'd broken my right arm and I couldn't draw with my right arm, but I learned, I learned how to draw with my left hand um, on my iPad and the, the cartoon editor loved the drawing, so I drew the finish with my left hand. Oh, where are you going? Oh. <laughs> Hi. I told you my desk was closed. Oh, uh, good. Here's Judy. Hi. Thank you very much. We were up at the exhibit this past weekend, and it's marvelous. So thank you for sharing all your wonderful work with us. Um, I was wondering if you and your husband worked together on pieces, except for that first one, because it was so fun seeing that collaboration. Uh, yes, actually, a few times, considering our careers, that's, that's not very many, but we, uh, the first time we did it was when, in the, in the 90s, when Tina Brown was editor of The New Yorker, she had these comic strips, um, uh, not in the magazine, and they were about, like, things happening in, like, news items or, or events, and Michael and I pitched to her to go to, um, Beetle Fest, if you guys know what that is. <laughs> It's a, it's a convention for Beatle fanatics, uh, as in the musical Beatles. Um, and so we went to Beatle Fest together and we did a little report, you know, reportage together. And that was fun. And then in, the, in Cartoon Marriage, which we're, we're going to show that book later in this PowerPoint, um, we did, every chapter had a, cart had a graphic narrative um, at the, at the of it, which we shared doing. So, um, and it, it did not ruin our marriage. We were, we were Turned out okay. No, I'll just mention that the amazing.
amazing Ed Corrin is actually uh, on the program. Exactly. And Ed spoke last Tuesday night, and he was just incredible. And Ed, I don't know if there's anything you want to jump in with, but we'd love to have you join the conversation if you like. Sure. Actually, I, um, I have a question looking at the wonderful environment you're living in and um, thinking how it mirrors mine. And also something I've thought about a lot is that uh, given the removal from urban life and even suburban life, being in a rural environment, uh, which is um, not what one thinks of as being gritty and prone to great satirical thoughts and nas nastiness uh, that the city life sometimes breeds, or the, um, the constant parade of, of incidents and human dramas that you see on city streets. So I wonder how you, how you f deal with that, how you fare with that in terms of being the, the wonderful social satirist that you are. <laughs> So it's good to hear you again, Ed. We can't see you, but good to hear you. Yeah. Well, I see you. It's, it's great. I love to see your environment. It's just, just marvelous. And, uh, yeah. you know, so what I'm thinking is that, that we are basically malcontents in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of deep and persistent and almost generic way. That is, cartoonists well, have been over, over generations of satirical work. Um, trying to, to uh, correct the behavior of others. So, it, 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 and, and you are in an idyllic situation there, as am I. And it, I always think about this, and I wonder how you think about it. Um, I have a lot of things to say. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you. I think, I think most cartoonists, I've, I've said this before, uh, we, we are maybe not malcontents, but we're misfits. And we're on the edges of society, and that's that's why we do what we do. It's like we're on the outside looking in. Um, but that said, with the with the idyllic versus the city, I, I, I get what you're saying, and I think about it a lot because I I love both, and I we still have an apartment in the city, and I'm down there every week. Not now, of course, but um, and I, I need I personally need that energy and that as you said that constant flow of humanity going by me. I just thrive on that. So that's. When we moved up here, we, we had kids right away, and I was very busy with that, doing cartoons and staying in touch with the city and, and life. There was no internet yet, but um, once the internet came, it was like gold for me to get mm. to be more in touch with the world while living here. And like I said earlier, I'll, I'll speak for Michael for a second. He, he's so interdirected in his little world, even though he's very well informed with the news. Um, your That's your little world of cartoon characters is is. Totally. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I, I think I learned very early on, maybe when I was like four. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really care where I was as long as I had a piece of paper, and a, piece of paper <laughs> and a pencil. And that's true to today. I, I uh, for some reason, I don't seem to need um, stuff happening around me. I don't. I'm just, I'm just happy to go to work every morning and uh, sit over that blank, you know, the classic cliche blank piece of paper and uh, see what happens. And I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't thrive off of uh, anything really, other than coffee maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, uh, here's our UPS fan, by the way. This is real. Fun. Um, so very different that way, and uh, that's that's fine. But you know, as as our dear uh, departed friend Jack Ziegler would say, whatever works, that's what <laughs> whatever works, and that's what works for you. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to quickly, for Elwood's sake, because we only got your tools. This is my tool. <laughs> there we go. It's a rapidograph, and it's a little technical pen. I've used the number one point since I was about uh, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> that's what I use to fill it up with ink. And, uh, that looks like a modern rapidograph. Can you hear me? Well, the, the barrel is modern. I have all of my old ones because they cracked from holding them. <laughs> the barrels cracked and wouldn't hold the point anymore. It would get loose. So it is a modern one. That is true. Uh, and I just replaced <laughs> the point. 
which was quite old. It's finally clogging. Um, but that's oh, what I use. I love this cartoon. Yeah, it's so fun to find out that Kubrick's basement was also unfinished. It's really great. <laughs> I, I added this one simply because it was one of the rare times that I got something. We, we do get occasional now emails from the uh, fact checkers or from somebody correcting our grammar or something like adding a period or taking away. But this was probably the only rough drawing I got back where they, uh, this is during Lee Lorenz's time, and it had on the back an actual engraving, I think, of Schubert. And it said, this is what Schubert looks like. Because <laughs> I, I don't remember what I drew, but I just made up some guy that I thought would look like Schubert. So, uh, and I still have that piece of paper somewhere. But I thought, wow, that's, this is probably from the 80s, I think, mid 80s. I thought, well, it's pretty intense. They're watching us that closely. Are they gonna, you know, go into basements and see if all that stuff is okay? I just kind of made up. I don't know up. what half that stuff is. Yeah, I just <laughs> made up, but I, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> that's why that's there. I like the drawing, but I also like the fact that they gave it such a thorough, um, <laughs> Right. I, lo I love the way Michael makes stuff up because I I've learned a lot from you about that. Like you, I like I, I would panic. I like I don't know how to draw a furnace. I can't draw a furnace. Well, you can sort of make it up. You know, you don't have to. Nobody else knows what a furnace looks like except for furnace repairman. Well, but you can sort of make it up and get the general gist of a furnace. And, and Ed Corn mentioned George Price when he was on with you guys, and uh, this is very George Boothian, George Priceian, and and adding all that stuff. Both of them love yeah. to add things and I, we are influenced by, by everybody and um, sometimes my influences show a lot more than others and this definitely is a Boothian, mm -hmm. George Price. I say George because it was a Garrett Price. Uh, also great cartoonist for sure. Oh. We have another really uh, good question for Michael actually from Jessica Esch. I wonder, yes. Jessica, if you're oh, yes. a friend yes. of ours, yep. I guess. If you'd, oh, like, to, if if you'd of... like to ask Michael your question, that would be great. Okay. Hey, Jess. Is this going to be a numbers thing or something? Jess is also an illustrator, artist. She okay. keeps, Jess, a great, uh, she keeps track of uh, yeah. gender uh, numbers. That's why I mentioned that she keeps track of the gender numbers. Of, in, in the magazine, like who, how many women cartoonists, male cartoonists? I think she. Does. Oh wow! Yeah. She also does it for uh, writers and cover yes, artists. everybody. Let's see if we can hear her voice. If not, I can ask her question. All right. So we might have a hard time bringing Jessica up, but he she asks, uh, Michael, have you had any temptation to go digital? Because obviously, Liza went a little bit in that direction now. And how about you? I have had no temptation to go to digital. I don't even, I, I'm not even tempted to go to a uniball micro whatever pens that people all use now. The, me using that rapidograph is, that's old, very old school. And a lot, I know a lot of people <laughs> still, still draw on paper, use micro or something or other, micro pens, and I don't know yeah. what they use. But um, no, I, I have no, I love the internet. I'm on it all day long because of ink spill. And so I love it as a tool, that tool, that kind of tool, but I don't have, uh, I don't know, not, not up for that. I'm Thank glad you. I was happy with it though. <laughs> nice. Great. Liza, said, do you want to read this caption? Um, the little boy is saying, I don't see liking trucks. The boy, <laughs> I see it as a liking trucks thing. Um, so is one of my, I, first of all, I love sandbox drawings. I love putting words in the mouths of kids in sandboxes. Uh, some psychiatrist can analyze that. Um, but I think also, I think my influence in that regard is, is Charles Schultz, the Peanuts uh, genius. Cause I, I love Peanuts growing up and I, he always had, you know, among all the fun and funny stuff that those kids did, he often would have like a real poetic thing to say that came out of those kids now, or that Snoopy did. So I was a big, big fan. Um, and this is a, just a twist on a gender conversation that, I mean, I, we were having this conversation when our kids were, our daughters were young. So the sandbox is kind of like a, uh, for adults, it's like Starbucks. In a way. 
I mean, they get together and they hang out for a long yeah, time. Yeah, and I've done Starbucks and paint drawings. And they yeah. say things to yeah. each other. And I, I noticed you both also use a, a kind of a caveman occasionally, a caveman, yeah. cavewoman uh, format. What, what, do you, what do you like about that? Oh, just this one. Oh, well, this is not caveman. Um, it's also a, a format for me that it's fun to draw. I, you know, I don't know, the, the animal skins that they wear, it's kind of fun to draw that. But they, for me, it's like a way to talk about things in our culture that are stupid or silly. Like, um, um, I've, I've done cavemen drawings about, um, about uh, humor, about, about marriage, about uh, I don't know, oh, martinis, you know, things that clowns. are clowns. Yeah. So it's a way to comment on, on our culture. Like, people in the cavemen era run across a, an engagement ring. Like, what is that? Why are you wearing that rock on your finger? So. It's extremes, isn't it? I mean, it's, yeah. it's uh, let's go to the extreme. Let's go to the earliest humans we can think of and make them deal with stuff that we have and see what happens. I mean, that's what we do. We just throw things together. And yeah, it's like random, random. Let's see what happens. Uh, yeah. How do you go with this idea? Speaking of early humans, this, I mean, this is, or non-humans, early creatures, this is a very funny cartoon. Do you want to say something about this, Michael? Well, I, I, do, I do like, um, there are a lot of, go-to uh, moments that cartoonists have. The Desert Island is probably the most famous one. I've done a lot of Desert Island cartoons. And this, is an, this might be the number two one that I go to. And I do it because it, it's challenging. You think, you know, you, there's not gonna be another one of these evolution drawings that's, that's gonna work, that I, at least I would send in. I do a lot that don't work. But, um, and then every once in a while, something happens like this. Maybe, I think, uh, I like fish dicks. I think that's really <laughs> The fish just come first and then you put them in that? Or they, you're just drawing Look at the chart, dear. It's, they, no, I know, you, in your evolve, head. In your, no, I know, oh. in your head, did the fish dicks come first? Like, I don't uh, do a I, fish stick drawing? I don't know. I mean, I think that's what's fun about these is that you draw, for me, I just draw that line, that kind of French curve, and then, you know, what's going to happen? I, I don't know. And uh, I, we don't have fish sticks often here. <laughs> so I think maybe I wanted them or something. And, and so I drew them. <laughs> it, it all made sense after that. Makes that's, sense. How they, that's how stuff happens. Really so we have a great question for both of you from Susan Rankin Pollard. Have you ever come up with an idea together that, ha um, that had some conflict over who would draw it? Uh, well, just in the cartoon marriage narratives, we, uh, we would, we would, uh, we debated that, like, who should draw which part of that narrative, like, because Michael's really good with perspective, and I'm not, so if there's any perspective involved, clearly would go to him, um, but, no, we, we don't draw together that often, so it's, it's only that book. Yeah, 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 that was, and that went smoothly, but. The only the only section we didn't we had trouble with that we almost that we argued over was the chapter about arguing. We argued over that drawing. Wow, what was the argument? I, I, oh, how we argue. We were arguing about how how we argue. Because we don't really <laughs> argue. Like, we don't argue. Uh, we do, but not that often. No, I am finished my sentence. Yeah, oh, sorry. So. <laughs> Liza, do you want to read this caption? Oh, okay. Um, you don't have to go to this party. It's men optional. Mm. Ouch. <laughs> it's this from the 90s, Tina Brown, another one of Tina Brown uh, choices. And it was a time when I was still using more, a lot more gray wash. I've, I've gone away from that since. Is that a Robert Weber influence there? Robert Weber, great yeah. cartoonist. Look him up if you have an anthology. I was influenced by a lot of people with this. I, uh, I'm not sure why. I think I'm not sure why I switched for a while. But. Okay, there we go. There's another oh, one well, of my rules. Yeah. This is similar to the fish sticks, I think, uh, in a way. It is. Although we do have meatballs here every once in a while, so uh, I think we may have just had meatballs the night before. 
so they were on my mind. And uh, this is, I gave you this one to show because even for me, I, a lot of times I just think of something and then I just do it immediately and it's done. And I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it too much. I just do it and put it in my pile to go to uh, Emma Allen, our cartoon editor. This one is what you see is what I drew that very moment when I thought of the whole thing. And um, I, for some reason, I thought of that man. I'm pointing at the man holding the meatball. And for some reason in my mind, the whole thing came to me and I saw that man going up these steps like that, which I never draw. And I thought, oh, that's fun. Can I do that? I mean, I know I can do it, but can I do it so that it works well? And so this was the first take. It's like in a music studio. This is the first take of this drawing. I just did it just like that. And um, the way it's, it went. And the New Yorker published it, uh, I think, late last year or something. Like maybe this year. I don't think. I, I mean, with, with that, I'm just noticing now the steps. It makes it even funnier because he's had to struggle. <laughs> that's right. With yeah. the meatball. He just had him walking straight on the Flat. Well, that's how, it's, yeah. uh, it's much more funny in that way. That's and how then I he also had to pull the thing down on the uh, pull the thing up on the on the truck. Mm -hmm. It's all very funny. Yeah, you have to get the meatballs. Look at that perspective. <laughs> anyway, that came to me visually as boom, and then I just did it, and it's very pleasing. We have a question from YouTube from Monica on YouTube. She wants to know if you are generally uh, on board with each other's point of view uh, or you know, are there exceptions to that? In, in, in anything specifically? Point of view uh, I think, you know, she's, I guess she's wondering if you're, if you're generally on the same page in terms of um, your work. Oh, yeah. Or maybe supporting, support of, of each other. Well, yeah. that we are. Yeah. Yeah, that, that we are. Yeah. I mean, I think we, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about cartoons, and it's cartoon land here. We just talk about <laughs> a lot. We have a huge number of, uh, you know, books about cartoons, and we'll reference things that remind each other of things. And uh, and we and as you heard, we both come out of the Thurber School of Cartooning, so we have that foundation. It's very strong, and yeah, I think our our points of view are very similar. Grapes. Liza, this was a, a very significant cartoon for you. Do you want to read the uh, caption and then say a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, put this in for a reason, yeah. Um, little girl saying, Daddy, can I stop being worried now? And um, it's not funny, but it's a cartoon that I did right after nine, uh, two months after 9-11. Um, uh, and I, I wanted to show the audience how I do sometimes do non-funny sort of slightly political cartoons. And um, uh, this one, after 9-11, I, I thought, I really started questioning, like a lot of people, questioning my, my uh, purpose in life. Like, why am I, what cartoons? Is that really what I want to do? Um, and I drew this and the New Yorker bought it and printed it and sort of, I felt like, okay, I, maybe I do want to keep doing this. Uh, I, I, found a, I found a niche and, um, and, and, and after this, I decided to, to, to try to do more political cartoons. I've always, I wanted to be a political cartoonist when I was a kid, um, but I didn't think I had enough strong opinions to be one. Um, and so, uh, then I found the New Yorker and I realized that they had, they have political cartoons in, in the magazine. They have, always have, um, but they're, they're, they're different. They're not the hard hitting ones you think of, of people attacking politicians and although they do that now in the New Yorker. Um, so it, it was a good fit for me. And this is the kind of political cartoons that I've done sort of quiet observations about how politics affects people. And, um, who was your hero? I know you had at least several. Well, when I was growing up in Washington, D.C., I, I loved Her Block, who was the Washington Post cartoonist, um, and he, he helped bring down Richard Nixon, and um, and also Gary Trudeau of Doonesbury was a big fan of hers. And then he, Trudeau also did, does, he's still working, um, cartoons that talk about culture and about racism and sexism and, you know, cultural things, not just 
Maybe a little Ed Sorrell. Not back then. I didn't know who he was. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I guess um, I will ask you this question from YouTube, which is how do you figure out how to make unfunny topics funny? So, I mean, you've certainly dealt with topics that are challenging, you know, that are uh, current events in terms of some of the things you were just mentioning. How do you bring humor to those kinds of topics? Not, sometimes not easy. That's more of your... Yeah. I avoid, I avoid all the unpleasant topics. <laughs> Very few, like for you. Um, um, but you, you take on the news. I mean, you look at the news and you, and you right? Yeah. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I, I don't know how to answer that exactly. Uh, how do you make unfunny things funny? Sometimes you just can't. Sometimes you have to find a way. You really, you have to find things that you really want to talk about um, and find and figure out why, why you want to draw about that and what what's behind it. Like that 9-11 cartoon, what's behind the tragedy of the, of the attack is, that's not funny, but and neither is the cartoon I drew, but um, the underlying thing that was going on at, a month or two after 9-11 is we, the United States was, totally shocked we were brought into with the rest of the world in in worrying about terrorism it's like we joined the rest of the world and so that's and then we're still there so that cartoon could be could be now too so yeah thank and you it with the internet too. so um cartoon marriage can you tell us a little bit about this book what brought you to decide to work on a project that focused on the subject of marriage together uh, yeah, I think if, if people go to YouTube, I guess some of you are already there, and you go to Married New Yorker Cartoons, you'll see a piece that CBS Sunday Morning did on us back then when this book came out, which was then 2010. And um, in, in there, we're on record as saying, and I think it's true, we, we knew, since we loved New Yorker history, we knew that we were the second married cartoonist New Yorker couple very specific thing there, but Alan Dunn and Mary Petty were the first. And- uh, The 30s. Yeah, and, and so we were aware that we had our tiny little piece of uh, history there. And since uh, us, and there have been, I think, two or three other couplings of New York cartoonists, uh, but at the time we were, we were the second and there wasn't a third yet. Uh, so we just thought, well, this will be fun, you know, this, we should do this. And I think it also came out of, we, we would have wanted Alan Dunn and Mary Petty to do something like, like What's it like to be married to Dolly Fortunas? Yeah, we're, and and we're also we, we, we as, a, as independent people, we've done many, many, many cartoons about marriage, not our own marriage, but other people's marriages. So we knew we had a lot of material there already. We had hundreds of cartoons about marriage. It was thousands, thousands, sorry. It's a matter of figuring out how many to put, which ones to put in. So, yeah. um, and then we made it unique by to what to us by by those graphic pieces that we yeah. we did together, and that was really a lot a lot of fun. And what's the one more little anecdote about that book? It was a really fun book to do, uh, and CBS, as you said, CBS Sunday Morning did a thing on it, and um, and then it got optioned for a, for a sitcom. Which um, by Jennifer Garner, she her company. Wow. Yeah, and uh, the script was written by Terry Minsky, who um, is a seasoned TV person, is, and um, she came up and spent a day with us. <laughs> she wrote a script, and uh, it got really close to getting picked up, but alas, it didn't happen. So that that was fun. That was a little, a little adventure in TV land. That must have been exciting for sure. Yeah, it was odd. So we have a, a question from Jessica, and I think Jessica is going to actually ask you directly. Great. Hi, Jess. Oh, it looks like my audio is working. Um, there it is. Liza, I was just wondering if you are the first person to be published in the New Yorker uh, who, in, in both hands. 
Oh. <laughs> Left and right and hand. Surely Michael knows the answer to this. I know. I was going to turn to him. Do you that know? is a, that, no? I think we talked about this. Well, let's say that this. I have never come across anyone saying that they were right. ambidextrous. So. I'm not going to say I'm ambidextrous, but I. That's did. true. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, a fun, that's a fun question. I, have, I wrote about the whole experience um, for the New York Times. So if you want to read about it, you can go to the New York Times. And oh, I remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was weird. I, felt, I really felt sorry for my left hand. I was drawing, you know, my right hand was incapacitated because it was in a sling. And I suddenly began to notice my left hand. Like, I haven't paid enough attention to you since I stopped playing the piano. Um, it really needed to, to be to be bombed over for a while, so it had its moment in the sun. And I don't, I don't, I don't draw with it anymore. So. I don't think we'll ever know. The, there's some questions we will never know the answers to <laughs> at the New Yorker. That's yeah. one of them. Maybe I should make a list of questions we'll never know the answers to. Life, if you want to read this caption, a little bit about um, the the. The man on the left is saying to his friend, uh, "I hear their marriage is in trouble." Uh, I don't know. I don't know why I like this cartoon, and Michael likes it too. Well, it's my favorite Liza Dolly cartoon of all time. Yeah. I love drawing people that are dancing wildly like that. Mm -hmm. what I like to do, um, but you never know what's going on in somebody else's marriage, and, and, and you don't you don't know the dy dynamics. Clearly, it does not look like their marriage is in trouble, but you just don't know. It's very Thurber too, I think that's what I like about it. Show, it shows your Thurber roots, and uh, but it's also you, and it's just what you just said is, you know, you never know. You never and it's your favorite, that's amazing. And this one from you, Michael, on marriage. Yeah, uh, that's another one of those, although this one is very low on the, on the, uh, the list of um, things people go to cartoons, but, you could probably do a third, maybe a fifth of an anthology of marriage signs on the back of cars. Or signs on the back of cars. cars. Yeah. I've done one. And uh, it's a know, cliche. But, That's what cartoonists do. We take, oftentimes, you take a given like a cliche and you put something unexpected in it. And that's why it's funny. Mm -hmm. Or not funny. Not funny. Not, not, <laughs> not, uh, but this one, I, yeah, I'm very happy with that. And I still. I, I still, this is my favorite one of these of my own that I've done, not my favorite one of this kind. And I still, and I use the word challenge again, because it is challenging to draw a car with a sign on the back. What are you gonna, what are you gonna do, you know? Uh, and, um, I don't, I think I've done a few maybe that were published, but uh, this is the favorite And one. you can see in that car, car that drawing, and see Michael's Jersey roots and the way he drew that car. He's really into cars. <laughs> I, I can't draw a car. Yeah, it was a fun to save my life. Fun to draw. Fun to draw those houses in the back, which is not well. That's northern Jersey. It's not where I grew up. It's up in the Jackie Kennedy horse country. I love the way she's staring out the window. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of staring in cartoons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that thing to do. Staring. So uh, I'd like to invite our director, Lori Norton Moffat, uh, to say a few words. She's got a, got a couple of observations. Lori, do you want to jump in? Hi, Lori. Hi, Lori. Oh. Let's see if we can hear Lori in a minute. Lori, Lori's the director. She's it's such a great museum. OK. Well, we may not, Lori, when, when, you, when you want to jump in, just jump in. There she is. Here I am. There she is. Thank you. I was ruminating over uh, earlier uh, when you talked about drawing not funny cartoons, that we, we associate the word cartoon with funny, but sometimes what you're able to do as cartoonists is really illuminate an idea and help us identify with a notion that might be terrifying, might be sad, might be scary, might be, you know, world um, erupting, such as during 9-11, or I even think about 
you know, the horrors happening in the world today and that sometimes cartooning isn't funny. And yet you illuminate and really help us see. And I just wondered if you might talk about that a little bit of how you really, you know, key into the essential elements of an idea and you lighten it enough to help us receive it and then hold it. Great observation, Laurie. Yeah. That's your department. <laughs> Uh, I think I learned a lot from in recent, like the last 15 years, a lot from my international cartoon friends that, um, but most of them, most of them are political cartoonists and how they, they draw like what you just said, they illuminate ideas often without, without words because they kind of have to cross borders with their work. Um, uh, and they do it in such a beautiful way. They, 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 they use the imagery so succinctly. And so like it gets, it gets the way they, and I, I, I aspire to this, the way they, they, with their drawing, they get to your heart and not necessarily to your intellect. So they're, they're getting you like immediately. And that's what cartoons do, whether they're funny or they're serious or whatever. We all love cartoons, right? We all, everybody around the world grew up reading some kind of cartoon, probably. Um, so we're all, we all sort of love cartoons and so we're drawn to them instinctually. So um, that's, that's, that's what cartoons can do. They can get at, get the heart and, and do it with imagery, not with words. So. Um, and that's, what, that's your challenge. That's what you, that's what you're good at. There's certain people that are good at that. I think it's clear, it's, well, it's clear to me anyway, that. There are cartoonists out there who can take, in the New Yorker, there are cartoonists, many of them who would read the headlines and have a cartoon in, in a few moments. Lies is one of those people. James Stevenson comes to mind, uh, Lee Lorenz. Actually, I said to Lee Lorenz once, I, my theory was there were just a few, and he said, well, we all do that. Well, I don't know. I, I think maybe we all do, but some of us are, and not me in this category, some are so good at taking a moment and uh, Paul knows comes to mind as somebody mm -hmm. these days. I don't want to start naming names. You just did. <laughs> I know I did. I would There's a lot that. of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. In the New Yorker and also the covers. Exactly. The covers do the same thing. Yeah. And, uh, and then international political cartoons that I talked about. Some of, some of our colleagues here in America. But there's something in their, in their mix that allows them to be able to do that. You know, it's, it's great. But, uh, well, I mean, you do it too on a different level. Like you're, you're tuned into the zeitgeist of of culture, like he'll, like that I meatball am. one. You are. Like the meatball, <laughs> meatball one. I mean, that's, really that's not political. It's kind of political. The meatball one in that um, our, our, our culture is, is having these delivery services like crazy right now. It's like, um, you know, I think that was pre delivery. But, so. Oh. So well, gonna... well, actually, I think, Liza, you've talked about how sometimes a cartoon can be done at a certain point in time and then something shifts in the world and it means something else yeah maybe yeah. michael that's one of the one of the ones that's right yeah. well yeah my my uh my drums one i didn't show this one but there's it's called so it's, uh, and there's another one uh, i don't know if we're going to show it but the fermenting one where they were they were drawn before the pandemic and then published or rebrought brought back in social media during the pandemic because they were pandemic like cartoons uh, so. I, I do have one i i think um Maybe I'm more of a selfish cartoonist. <laughs> I don't, I don't, like I say, I don't really try to draw things that are going on in the world. But I do, but I do attempt sometimes to deal with things that uh, I know for me are are, um, are troubling. And uh, I do a lot of doctor cartoons. <laughs> but I don't like going to the doctor. I do a lot of those. I do a, a good number of uh, cartoons about things in the water. So I'm frightened of the water. Uh, you know, deep sea things. I have a deep sea diver, like Diver Dan, remember Diver Dan yeah. over there. Um, so I, you know, I do go to some things that uh, I know are troubling to other people. But, um, but also you can look at, on, on the same level, you can look at cartoons in the past, in the New Yorker and, and elsewhere, and see how badly 
we were behaving, you know, um, cartoons that they thought were funny, that were sexist or racist at the time, um, are clearly wrong. So it's, uh, cartoons are a great window in how, how our culture is. It's history. It's just behaving. It's straight in history. Yeah, it's history, exactly. Um, you've got some great collections up here on the screen. These are other things that you've worked on together. I wonder if you would want to comment on some of these projects. So um, back when our daughter's second daughter was born, I, I, um, I don't know, how can I put it? I was nervous about raising daughters. I mean, I, I, you know, all the media about how difficult girls can be. Our our daughters ended up being not at all difficult. But I, I knew, yeah. So <laughs> when we had a second daughter, I thought, oh my god. So I did a book. I decided I'm going to do a collection of cartoons called Mothers and Daughters. And I invited a bunch of women uh, who draw cartoons to contribute. And that, that was the first one. And then we, we said to each other, well, we have to do Fathers and Sons. So we did Fathers and Sons and I was his help. And then we thought, well, we have to do Husbands and Wives. So we did Husbands and Wives and worked on that together. That was a precursor to, uh, to, to uh, cartoon marriage. But that they're all drawings of other people. Oh, this is just ours. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. No, but Fathers and Sons was cartoons by Ben, and Mothers and Daughters was cartoons by Ben. And then, and then, uh, you want to talk about that one? Yeah, Call Me When You Reach Nirvana, I think came out of the fact that we live, what, four minutes from something called the Omega Institute. And uh, I'll try to be pleasant and, and nice, but we find <laughs> it amusing about some of the things that, they, that go on down there. And so we got hold of their catalog and we just went through it and it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, <laughs> we, we love a, the Omega Institute. We love it's the Omega Institute. It's a whole Institute. different kind of thing. Yeah, like wonderful. drumming circles and crystals. I've never been crystals and, Yeah. Yeah, it's a they're wonderful great. place. No, they're great. Uh, <laughs> but um, we got this, this book came out of just really looking, I suppose we should have coped better, but looking at, at their catalog and, and just laughing at the, so many words and usages of, and it came out of time when that was a new thing. New yeah. age, new age, the new age. I forget. New age. Mm -hmm. So they, pro they provide a lot of inspiration. Um, Liza, this was an important project for you. And both of you are actually great historians of your field. And I think have documented uh, the work of some very important artists. So would you want to say a little bit about Funny sure. Ladies? Um, I could talk forever about this, uh, but I won't. Um, um, I always knew that the, the, the numbers were <clears throat> uh, in balance between men and women cartoonists. There were not as many women as, as men drawing cartoons. When I started, there, were, there was me, Roz, Chas, Nurit, Carlin, um, and um, Roz and Ango. So there were just four of us. And uh, it wasn't until, and I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't think I was a woman cartoonist, which is a cartoonist. But then in the, around 2000, I began to Think more seriously about why is that, and uh, you know, is there, what's going on here? Were there more women before? A lot more before. So I knew there were some, but so I wanted to find out if, how many more women were doing cartoons for the New Yorker before us, and because um, I knew about Helen Hokanson and Mary Petty, but, so I. This is Helen Hokanson. Um, Do you want to read the caption, yeah, Liza? Says, uh, this is her Club Ladies, which is a theme that she used a lot. Um, I just want to say that I'm perfectly willing to serve as treasurer, provided every penny doesn't have to come out exactly even. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, so I looked, I, so I started researching and I sold this book to Prometheus, uh, Funny Ladies, uh, based on how many, uh, on, the, on the, the history of women cartoonists at the magazine. And, the, and there was, in the first issue, there was a woman drawing cartoons. Uh, Ethel Plummer was her name. And then from there on, there were maybe about eight or 10 in those early years. Um, uh, and there were some more smattering in the middle of the decade, uh, last decade, century. Um, but it was so wonderful to read about those women and, and try to find them and, uh, and uh, it, you know, show, people, show the world their work. And uh, I'm actually, Stephanie, I'm, I, I'm con contracted to do an updated version of this book. So I'm very excited about that. It's going to come out next year. Very exciting. So will that, will you bring it into, uh, you know, kind of 21st century? Yeah, because, because now I have to point out, and Michael, Michael discovered this first back in 2017, I think, 
was the first issue ever where there were more women cartoonists than men cartoonists. And, uh, wow. and ever since then, um, it's been a, a good mix of numbers of men and women drawing cartoons. So it's, uh, things have certainly changed. Exciting. Uh, Jessica asked, asked uh, this racial person. She would know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Michael, this was a, a really important and exciting book that you worked on about Peter Arno. Would you want to talk a little about that? Yes, this was one of my favorite things I did other than be a husband and father <laughs> and New York cartoonist. Uh, this came out of the idea that this great cartoonist, who some people credited actually saving the New Yorker in its earliest years, first two years, his popularity saved the New Yorker, that no one had written about him further than maybe a few pages. And uh, when I realized that one day, I, I thought, well, somebody has to do it. Uh, I, I've never written more than a, a few sentences for a cartoon caption. So this was the idea of doing this really made me sweaty. And, and, uh, and But also, I was very excited about it. And uh, it did take a long time because I'd never written anything like this before. And um, Boy, what a what a ride! What a great great ride this was! And, and uh, one of the best things that came out of it for me was connecting with a lot of our uh, colleagues from the past, who uh, were at the ends of their lives. Unfortunately, some people like Sid Hoff, from Sky. Uh, at least I got to uh, to write to them, hear from them, and that was really great. And then, of course, to have finally to for uh, the book to come out. And uh, uh, Regan Arts did this book. And I, I think they did a great job, a really great job. They allowed me to do what, it, what I wanted to do. What more can you ask? Uh, he was so, a real character too. I mean, he, his drawing was amazing. Yeah. So very, man very about pleased. Town, very man about town, yeah. man about town. Yeah. Very pleased that it came out. Great, thank you. Oh, and actually here are a couple of great Arno cartoons. I don't know, Michael, do you want to say a little about these? Yeah, the, oh, the one on the right doesn't have a caption. Uh, it does have a caption, but it's not there. <laughs> the bartender peeking over to looking at the customer saying, well, that'd be all, sir. And uh, that looks like a 1950s cartoon. The other one looks 50s, 60s, maybe. And I don't remember the caption for that. He did a, almost a thousand cartoons, so I hope I can be forgiven for that. I can't remember my own caption. Yeah. caption. yeah. Uh, something about a likeness, I think, is, is in the caption. Mm -hmm. A remarkable likeness. Yeah, that's the guy, yeah. Remarkable. <laughs> and he, uh, Arno would do full pages like those. And, uh, wow, what a, so what a great job. Yeah. yeah, beautifully designed and funny. So this is uh, a shelf with lots of your books on it. Um, you guys have really worked on many publications, uh, Liza, you with the children's books and your, your joint compilations and individual projects. Um, what do the book projects mean to you? Why are they important? Um, well, uh, uh, I love doing the, many of my, a couple of my book projects are about women's issues, women artists, and that's important to me for obvious reasons and um, uh, the children's books I just love doing them they're nice they're nice distraction from politics <laughs> and I'm, I'm also influenced by William Stein and uh, I just loved William Stein's uh, children's books but uh, no you as a cartoonist you do a lot of different things and one of, I'm so lucky to be able to do do cartoons and that 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 shelf uh, is a is a, is a snippet of the snippet snapshot <laughs> of our, our cartoon book collections of everybody else's cartoon books. So we, we're collectors of New Yorker cartoon books and that's just a, some of them. And we, we came to our marriage with our own collection. So there's that. And we also have work from people. We've traded, it's a tradition of trading cartoons with your colleagues and, uh, and that's fun. So we have a great collection of original art from our, from our colleagues. Well, that's gotta be exciting for sure. And speaking of a lot of other things that you do besides your actual cartoons, um, Michael, you have a website called Inksville. 
and that is a regular blog where you write extensively on various subjects. Do you want to say a little bit about that? It's really terrific. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, uh, I think this, this is 10 years old now, I think still, roughly 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, um, it's become a vehicle for, for my, the busybody in me that likes to know what's going on in our cart New Yorker cartoon world. And I say New Yorker cartoon world because uh, the cartoon world in, in the world is just so huge. So I think it's easier for me, less stressful if I just focus on this magazine and the people that are in it. And that's what Inkspill is. I, I conceived it as a sort of a bulletin board for other cartoonists to, to know what's going on, what books are coming out. And it, it got a little bigger than that. And the other big part of it is the historical stuff that, uh, like the Peter Arnold thing, that just fascinates me. And when I say historical, I mean up to, to present, up to today. Uh, if somebody's in the magazine this week, last week, um, they're part of history now, and that, and that fascinates me, who they are, and uh, uh, eventually I'll get around to uh, knowing more about something, at least, about all these people. But that's what Inkspill is. It, uh, I devote a lot of time to it every day, lovingly, and um, I, it's another really fun, fun thing to work on most, every day, every day. Yeah, Except you, it's and you can all actually catch Liza doing live drawing every day at 5 p.m. Um, so we have a little snippet of that here. Liza, do you want to talk about live drawing? Well, this, uh, this actually is drawing on my iPad, and this was at an event. I, I do live drawing at, at events um, when we're not in the pandemic. I, I go places. I've been to the Oscars. I've been to the White House. I've been to the DNC and uh, conventions. This, this, I think, was in... Uh, 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 at the Hindustan Times in New Delhi. I was drawing a conference there. That was exciting. But, uh, and then on the right, as a public speaking, I, I do a lot of public speaking, talking about women's issues and peace and cartooning for peace. And so the live drawing every day at five is sort of a more is a thing I started during the pandemic. I just started, I thought, I really want to connect with people. And how can I do this? And I saw the Instagram TV function and I started doing that every day at five. I would draw about what was going on. I would draw just doodles sometimes about the pandemic. Like, what are we worrying about? What's going on? I, I, I'm, I'm worried about the, the, the cashiers. I'll draw the cashiers or I'll draw people in hospitals or whatever. And then, and then the Black Lives Matter, I drew about that. So, and just, you know, just talking to the audience and drawing at the same time. And people, and people can catch that on Instagram if they... Yeah, I do it on Periscope as well, uh, sometimes, every, uh, around the same time. But yeah, it's um, it's a way to connect. With, that's what cartoons are. I mean, you've heard me to say it says a million times. Cartoons about dialogue and connecting with people. So that's what I do. And as you say, they truly open conversations. Yeah. Um, I think maybe we'll end with one very fun question that came in. Let's see what you have to say about this. Um, this came in on YouTube. Do you doodle for each other in your daily lives? For example. Um, do you leave notes on the counter with drawings uh, that convey, let's just say something that might say, sweetheart, empty the dishwasher? <laughs> I am the dishwasher. <laughs> um, we have left notes for each other, like particularly when something important happens in one or the other's life, like a, a, an achievement, we'll leave a note. I leave a lot of emojis on emails. <laughs> but uh, we used to, we, we, sometimes Michael will write out directions if I have to go somewhere, I'm driving somewhere, and he, he would really wants to, to draw the directions for me, to draw them, not just write them, but draw them. Little houses in the, in, in the heat. So he, he, drawing is like instinctive to him. We used to doodle with our daughters all the time. One of the first things we, we did when we were st first starting to date, remember when people dated? <laughs> date. Uh, I remember that we laid on my floor in Kingston, New York, and, and uh, we had one piece of paper, and we would just, we, we would be drawing different things. And I actually found that, I found some of those drawings the other day. There's oh, wow. Several sheets of those where we just, uh, we're having fun oh, uh, yeah. just drawing together. You did that on, on uh, YouTube not too long ago. 
where we draw, oh, yeah, right we, were, we were competing, sort of, sort of competing, like you draw, um, you draw an elephant, I draw an elephant, you draw a car, I draw a car. Oh, it's the alphabet. Yeah, the alphabet. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun to see. sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. That's the operative word around here. So fun. <laughs> Well, it has been an amazing pleasure to speak with you both. And thank you for all the joy uh, that you have brought for so many years and for all the conversations that you've inspired through your art. It's really been uh, a pleasure to have Liza's work on view. And uh, Liza's exhibition will be on view through September 27th if you haven't had a chance to come in. Uh, and um, I'll just mention that next week at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, we will have a great conversation with Liza and some of her colleagues from Cartooning for Peace. And so we look forward to that greatly. Uh, Michael and Liza, thank you so much for joining us. You guys are absolutely amazing. And it was a thrill oh, thank to you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all out there for joining us. It was really a pleasure to have you with us and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thanks for having us. Oh, at the lockdown. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.